Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and today we are having a look at yet another fascinating piece of vintage night vision equipment. These are Israeli NV5151 driver's goggles. Now in previous videos we've looked at pre-generation zero night vision in the form of World War II era metascopes, generation 1 in the form of the Vietnam era AN PVS2, and generation 2 in the form of the PVS502. These are generation 0 slash 1, meaning that I'm only one generation away from completing the whole set. Gotta catch them all. Anyway, without further ado, let's have a closer look at these and let me show you how they work. Now, as I've covered in previous videos, generation 0 night vision devices like the American Sniper Scope and Snooper Scope and the German ZG1229 Vampire were developed and used in limited numbers during the Second World War. These are based on converter tubes like the RCA-1P25, which converted infrared light into visible images. Specifically, these tubes were sensitive to short to medium infrared wavelengths, which is only given off by extremely hot objects. As a result, these devices had to be used with an infrared light source to illuminate the target. This not only made them very heavy and bulky, but also made the user vulnerable to detection if the enemy also had infrared technology. By contrast, Generation 1, 2, and 3 night vision devices like the ANPVS-2, PVS-502, and ANPVS-14 use image intensifier tubes that collect and amplify ambient light sources like the moon or stars, hence why they are often called starlight scopes. Many current night vision scopes like the ANPAS-13 are also capable of thermal imaging, that is detecting far infrared, allowing them to detect humans, vehicles, and other common heat-emitting objects. Now, as I previously mentioned, these NV5151 goggles are generation 0 slash 1, meaning that while the tubes can detect visible light, they can't amplify it, and so the goggles require an active infrared light source in order to see in the dark. Indeed, these were developed as driver's goggles for use with headlights fitted with infrared filters, allowing you to drive in the darkness without being detected. Interestingly, devices like these were developed by the British as early as 1942 and saw limited use aboard British tanks during Operation Plunder, the March 23, 1945 crossing of the Rhine. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to find a whole lot of historical or technical information on these. However, they appear to be directly developed from some of the first night vision goggles to enter active military service, the SU-49 or PAS-5. Developed by International Telephone and Telegraph, or ITT Incorporated, of Stamford, Connecticut, the SU-49 was deployed in small numbers to Vietnam starting in October 1969. Being a Generation Zero device, it was issued with the ANPAS-8 infrared night aiming light, which could be mounted on an M16 rifle, the activation switch being fitted to the pistol grip. Unfortunately, early combat reports were not encouraging, largely due to the converter tubes being poorly manufactured and fragile. However, ITT soon developed an improved version of the goggles known as the SU-50, which were used in limited numbers in Vietnam by various special forces units like MACV SOG and the 46th Special Forces Company Airborne, most notably during Operation Ivory Coast, the November 21, 1970 raid to free American prisoners from the Tan Sai prison camp in North Vietnam. In 1972, the SU-50's image converter tubes were replaced with 43mm MX9916 Generation 2 image intensifier tubes to produce the ANPVS-5, the world's first mass-issued passive night vision goggles. And if you're wondering why they skipped directly from Generation 0 to Generation 2, that's likely because Generation 1 night vision devices like this ANPVS-2 here used multiple image enhancer tubes cascaded together and were way too bulky to adapt into a goggle format. Anyway, the ANPVS-5 was issued not only to brown troops, but also to Army and Air Force helicopter and aircraft pilots, though the ANPVS-C variant wasn't approved for flight use because it had a cutoff feature that shut off the goggles when they were exposed to a bright light. Not really something you want activating while you're in the middle of flying an aircraft. Also, the ANPVS-5's great weight and bulk and very narrow 40-degree field of vision made it very inconvenient to use. And so in 1982, the U.S. Armed Forces launched a study to find a suitable replacement. This resulted in the adoption of the ANPVS-7 for ground troops in 1988 and the ANAVS-6 Aviator's Night Vision Imaging System, or ANVIS, in 1989. Both of these systems used Generation 3 image intensifier tubes. And if you want to learn more about the technical differences between Generation 1, 2, and 3, please check out my video on the ANPVS-2 and PVS-502 night vision scopes, links in the description. 
Now, some of you movie fans out there might find the ANPVS-5 a little familiar, and that's because it served as the basis for the Ecto goggles in the Ghostbusters franchise. These NV-5151 goggles also have an interesting movie connection, as they appear to be the type used by the character of Buffalo Bill in the climax of the 1991 film The Silence of the Lambs. Now, it's possible that these are the older SU-50 that the NV-5151 was based on, but those had a round toggle-style on-off switch and hinged upward rather than downward from the faceplate. Furthermore, by the late 1980s, early 1990s, NV-515 goggles would have been readily available on the American surplus market, and that's very easy for a film production designer to pick up. That said, however, the film's depiction of these goggles is slightly inaccurate, because as I said, while these can see visible light, they can't really amplify it and require an active infrared light source in order to see in the dark, something that Buffalo Bill is not shown to be using. Ah, uh, Hollywood. Anyways. Going back to these, as I said, I couldn't find a whole lot of historical and technical information on them, though they appear to be based on the SU-50 goggles and to have been adopted in Israel around the 1970s or 1980s. Indeed, the hard shell carrying case for this is all but identical to that of the SU-49 or 50. If we open this up on the inside of the lid, we have a rubber wedge for maintaining the shape of the faceplate and a pair of labels. This one lists the contents of the case as follows. 1. Driving binoculars AA navigator. 2. Battery, 3. Operation Maintenance Instruction Booklet, and 4. Operation and Maintenance Card. Well, this one reads, batteries are to be removed after use. There is also a label on the goggles themselves that reads, forbidden to use in sunlight or next to a bright AA light. And I am informed by one of my viewers that AA stands for infra Adam or infrared, so thank you for pointing that out. Continuing with the markings, on the other side we have a serial number plate which bears the logo of the goggles manufacturer, Electro Optics Industries Limited, or LO, which was founded in 1962 and merged with the major defense contractor Elbit Systems in the year 2000. Zooming out, these goggles are built on a soft plastic chassis likely adapted from standard driving or dust goggles like the American M44, with a simple Velcro head harness and a foam rubber lining. The whole optical assembly is hinged so you can swing them out of the way as needed, which you do by swinging over this latch on the top. Now, unlike the SU-50 that these are based on, these actually swing downwards rather than upwards, a design decision that I was originally rather skeptical of, but as it turns out, even with my big schnoz, these don't interfere in any way, so fair enough. The optical assembly itself consists of two infrared image converter tubes with a battery compartment in the middle. This opens by twisting the end cap as so, and takes a 1.5 volt PX1 or LR50 battery. These are still used in certain cameras, so I was easily able to obtain one. The battery compartment cover also features an on-off switch that swings back and forth as so. On one end of each tube, we have a removable plastic cover to protect it from direct sunlight, while on the other, we have a rotating focus adjustment lever. Now, these appear to require a special tool to take them apart, which unfortunately I don't have handy, so I'm not going to disassemble these. However, these are fully functional, so why don't I power these up and let me show you what it looks like looking through them. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time in another video where we'll look at yet more night vision and other fascinating devices just like this. Until then, I'm Jun Messi from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.